first of all, I want to tell you, I am a member of the NRA. I'm a member of the grnc.org. Don't forget that. I have my concealed carry. I am very open about that. Everybody knows. Majority of people that I spoke to when I was running, I do have it. And your Second Amendment rights are utmost important to me. I can tell you one <clears throat> when I was down there last week. Some of the people around the table were talking and said, well, you're kind of new to Raleigh. I said, yeah, I am. And they said, well, how do you, where do you live? I said, well, right now I'm at the Red Roof Inn. And <laughs> they said, well, uh, is it an area that you feel safe in? I said, you know what? We've got 38 sitting right beside me. You better believe it. <laughs> I ain't going to be nowhere without it. <laughs> feel very comfortable with me, okay? You don't have to send me tons of emails. And believe you me, a hundred or two hundred a day is not a bit unusual. But you can tell people, I am for you. I am, I'm only one vote. But if, in speaking with other members of the, of the House that are down there, a lot of them, I can't tell you how many, but the ones that I talk to, they're very much in, uh, for the Second Amendment rights. You don't have, I, I won't say don't worry about all of them, but the ones that I've spoken to, are very firm with it, just like I am. So don't worry about it, Tim and Dr. Dan. Don't you worry about it. And if you, you know, I get a lot of them, they'll say, we're watching your vote. I'm like, hey, bring it on. <laughs> I want to, before you go, Ralph, I want to thank you very much for that. And I also want to say, if you feel comfortable with a 38, you feel a lot more comfortable than AR-15. Oh, <laughs> There is a lot of conversation, and I think there are things we can do as a state to move this forward in legislation. But when it really comes down to it, when an, am an amendment to the U.S. Constitution fails, the U.S. Constitution by amendment says that we as individuals have the right to keep and bear arms. Is there a backup that's possible at the state? <coughs> You know, we have a lot of legislative solutions we put forward. You know, I'm someone, I think, from my personal side, I own no firearm that the government's aware that I own. <laughs> and I intend to keep it that way. Yeah. Oh, let's come forward. But where we have to come down as a state in moving forward is that the solution to this remains our election. The solution to, we saw it happen a few months ago, we had a chance to end Obamacare in this nation, and we as a nation failed to do so. But if we are going to protect our Second Amendment rights, we can't put it in a piece of paper that comes from the legislatures. We can't put it in a ruling that may come from a court system that elected officials put in. We have to protect the Second Amendment each and every time at the ballot. Mm -hmm. We have to look at individuals who will represent us and where they will stand on the Second Amendment. Because those pieces of paper, as a matter of fact, if you put out resolutions, at times you're handing the federal court something to challenge, mm -hmm. to throw out. We as a state, and we've seen that happen on several occasions. The amendment to the Constitution established at the beginning is sufficient protections for our laws, for our others. There's nothing higher than the U.S. Constitution. And it's our job to defend it. And it's our job to defend it at the ballot box every time we go. You know, gun issues, ever notice that gun issues come up after the election? Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think we're talking about this right now in January and February instead of Obama saying this was a great idea in September, October? Because he's smart. <laughs> because he knows he doesn't want this in front of the individuals. And he quite frankly believes you'll forget by 2014. But 2014, the entire House of Representatives, the entire North Carolina legislature, a third of the Senate, are all back before the people of the United States again in an election.
And so four years from now, we'll choose another president. These choices continue to come forward. You can't forget them in between. So I think you have a strong legislature that will fight and stand for gun rights. That will fight and stand for individuals. But it's not something the legislature can do for you. Government is never the solution. I don't think I could say it any better than Senator Heiss or Representative Preston has already said it. But I'll just say this, in addition to that, there are some issues down there I'm already seeing. This is my second week in Raleigh, so I've not been uh, uh, corrupted yet, I'll say it that way, <laughs> <laughs> by Raleigh's place. But, uh, you know, there, I've already seen there's going to be a lot of issues come before the General Assembly, from education to energy to economic development. Uh, we've already had a discussion on unemployment in the House. And there's a lot of issues that you have to have to wrestle with your conscience. You have to read the material in depth. And you have to study each issue as it comes up because they're not very comp they're, they're not very easy issues to understand. And you really have to read the material and to grasp what's going on. Well, the Second Amendment is not one of those issues that's difficult to understand. I see the legislation. I think there's two, and if you count uh, the resolution from Representative Shawley. There's three that I'm aware of right now in the House, or maybe more, but three that I'm aware of. And uh, I told them, just sign me up. I'm voting for all of them because, as it's already been said, it's already been uh, eloquently stated, the Second Amendment is what we're about. And we're going to support that. I'm certainly going to support it and uh, look forward to representing you in that way in Raleigh. Thank you. Uh, Tim. You raised a very interesting point, and I would, would like to amplify that as well. You know, uh, the speed limit out here on 19 is, uh, what is that, 45 around here? How many people broke the speed limit getting to this meeting? <laughs> Sheriff is not going to close your eyes over there. <laughs> How many people actually traveled faster than the speed limit on US 19 on the way to this meeting? <laughs> Come on. That is really the point, isn't it? Because a government that's bent upon becoming a totalitarian government makes law after law after law after law, and then what does it do? It selectively enforces those laws against the people they want to persecute time and time and time again. So we have a ton of laws for that purpose so that they can be selectively enforced. I also want to make a comment to you guys from Ra the Raleigh contingent over here. Uh, remember that we are a federation of sovereign states. That is what our country is. Yeah. And what we need to start using, and I know my constitutional companion on the right here is going to dis can discuss this very well, and that's the, the fact that we can use nullification to get rid of unconstitutional federal laws. There is no excuse for not using it. It is a legal remedy. It is the rightful remedy of the states against an oppressive federal government. I've seen a lot of discussions that are very clear that the Supremacy Clause does not apply to nullification. If the federal government puts out a law that is unconstitutional, the states have the right to nullify it and say, we will not do it. What do you think? Well, that's exactly what was the point of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions in, in 1798, which I think I've gained some traction again in recent years. By the way, on behalf of John C. Calhoun, I'd like to thank you for your comments. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, excuse me, nullification, if it's uh, accompanied by uh, legal action to change the laws, is perfectly legitimate. You cannot, however, uh, nullify as was attempted back during the nullification crisis in, in say, 1832, where you simply declare a law unconstitutional in a state and refuse to follow it, such as the, uh, the, uh, the you know, well, the Air and Sedition Acts of the, the end of the second, 18th century. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. It happens when you get past 15. <laughs> I think that your point is well taken, though, and certainly uh, 
the state a state has a right to pursue that uh, ground within limits, provided it doesn't involve something you know, unpleasant like secession. Yeah. But people are talking about even that today, mm -hmm. and this is the first time I think in in a century and a half that that has occurred. Right. Well, one other thought, just in passing, about this business of uh, people supporting the Constitution and following orders. I wanted to try and get it in there a little bit earlier, but uh, this is maybe my last chance. Uh, all military personnel are trained, or at least they were back in you know, pre-revolutionary times when I was in the Army, that <laughs> an order which is illegal or unconstitutional need not be uh, obeyed, and in fact, you are duty-bound not to obey such an order. And I think that's the point that the sheriffs have, have made here clearly today. If they're given the order to disarm the citizens, they will refuse, as a constitutional person ought to. <laughs> the colonel brought up a really incredible point, and that is, is when you take that oath to defend the Constitution, against enemies foreign domestic, you also are obliged not 